I was living in a flat share on the outskirts of a city which is known for generally being very safe. A key is needed to enter the main building, but often the door isn't shut properly and so doesn't lock. Not really a cause for concern for anyone in the building, as it's a very trusting neighborhood. It's around 2 a.m., and I'm laying in bed, naked, completely sprawled out. Someone opens my door and enters. I figure it's one of my flatmates going to the balcony. You have to walk through my room to access it, so it's completely normal that someone might come in at this time. I've just smoked a joint, and it's 2 a.m., so I opt to ignore him and pretend to be asleep. I can feel him standing there for about two minutes. I think... Maybe he's waiting for his girlfriend to join him, and maybe he stood there checking his phone. No big deal. He goes on to the balcony. Takes about two or three minutes, so I figure it's definitely him. He's smoking a cigarette. He comes back in and goes back to standing in total silence, but I'm half asleep and don't really think anything of it. The next morning, my flatmate tells me that someone broke in came into my room, went into the room of my flatmate, and rummaged through his things, went into the kitchen, and upon seeing my flatmate wake up and come to see what was going on, quickly exited the building. The only thing he stole was my pair of Marshall headphones. We were all very confused as to why they only stole my headphones as opposed to money left on the table, or my flatmate's multiple cameras, for example. We spoke to our neighbors, of which there were around 15 in the building, and not one of them had noticed anything out of the ordinary. They hadn't gone into any of the other apartments. We know that most of the neighbors also don't lock their doors at night, so it sounds as if they walked up three flights of stairs, ignored the other apartments with the sole intention of coming to ours. And given the stealth, it's unlikely that they were intoxicated and it was just a mistake. Nothing else came of it. The police said they'd keep an eye out and I had to buy a new pair of headphones, but it left me thinking about what would have happened had I opened my eyes and alerted this person standing over me. Would they have hurt me? Would it be a total stranger or someone whom I've already met? When I was younger, maybe around 13 to 14, I was walking to town with my mother. I live in a smallish town in England. It was a quick walk, but about five minutes after leaving my home, I had one of the most unsettling encounters ever. Whilst walking, there was a man approaching us. Nothing weird at this point. I thought he'd walk past us like everyone else. However, this random man leaned in towards me as he was walking past and whispered something to me. I remember it being creepy and along the lines of him knowing where I lived. It was subtle and happened quickly. I was shocked, especially since my mother was right next to me. Bold move from a creepy guy. I recall the man being possibly in his late twenties, kind of scruffy looking, a bit chubby with longish brown hair and a beard, but I knew I'd never seen him before this point. I waited a few seconds for us to distance ourselves from the stranger then turned to my mom completely freaked out and quietly asked if she heard what the guy had said. She said she didn't. I thought maybe I misinterpreted the situation or misheard him then. We kind of brushed it off and continued with our day. I felt uneasy but tried not to think about it. The rest of the day was fairly normal. Until the morning after when my dad was talking to our neighbor. Our neighbor told my dad that during the early hours of the morning... There was a man lurking right outside our houses for some time, hovering around my dad's and neighbor's cars. Now, this is really weird because we live in a kind of closed-off area. The only people we see outside our homes are neighbors, but even they wouldn't come right up to our doors, especially not at like 2 or 3 a.m. Even delivery drivers can't find our house most of the time because we're hidden away. This has never happened before and never happened again after this, at least to our knowledge. Of course you can imagine how absolutely terrified I was to hear this. 
I explained to my dad what had happened the day before and reminded my mom, kind of an I told you so moment. I felt so scared to be in my own home. I remember calling my friend and talking about the situation. We researched about what we could do, but there wasn't really any action we could take. We just had to be observant and cautious, I guess. I can't remember much about what happened after that, but I never saw the man again. The whole situation creeps me out, and it doesn't make any sense. The man outside my house wasn't confirmed to be the same man that walked past me earlier, as it was too dark to make out any discernible features, but it sure is an amazing coincidence, if so. This story happened three years ago, around the time that the pandemic started, so it was a while back, but still worthy of a post. It was early 2020, and I'd just gotten a new job in a small town near my area. While looking for a place to live, my sister offered to rent her house to me. She'd bought the house two years prior, but she and her husband didn't really take to it, and their commute to work was so long, they moved out and the house was uninhabited. Luckily for me, it was actually pretty close to my workplace, and my sister pretty much rented it to me for free. I just paid for the water and electricity and looked after the house. I was living there for a solid two or three months and had already gotten used to it. One night, after coming back from work and parking my car, as I walked towards my door, I noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb to my house. I leaned down and picked it up, thinking that it might have been mine since I'm a smoker, but after looking at the brand name, I realized that it wasn't mine and threw it away. I didn't think much of it and just shrugged it off as some asshole throwing it at my curb. I went on with my night and nothing unusual happened. Two days later, I was once again walking to my house when I spotted a few more cigarette butts, this time near my porch. Needless to say, I was pissed off and thought that someone sat on my porch and smoked, but since I didn't know who it was, there was nothing I could do about it. I noticed that they were put out pretty recently, so whoever it was probably walked off as I was approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop and it was pretty late, about 1am, so I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. It's a suburban neighborhood and it was the pandemic so people rarely ventured out at night, but I didn't think much of it. Around half an hour later, I was surprised when I heard chattering nearby. I listened intently, but I couldn't hear what they were talking about as their voice seemed almost muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly got off my sofa and walked to the front door to make sure that it was locked. As I was approaching the front door, I froze mid-step as I heard the two approaching my porch and reducing their talking to a whisper. I realized right away that whoever this was wanted to break in. I leaned against my front door and waited, expecting a loud bang against the door or the doorknob to be shaken, but it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to my window to see if they'd walked away or changed their mind. My windows have bars from the inside out that you have to unlock so that you could move the curtains or look out the window comfortably. I slowly unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtains and was taken aback. Leaning up against my window was a man. He was as startled as I was because he basically stuttered over his own steps as he jumped back. He tightened his hoodie to cover his face so all I could really see was his big blue eyes looking at me. His friend realized what was going on and right away started to kick the door in. He kicked it a solid four or five times, but the door wouldn't budge. All the while, I was staring at them, frozen in fear and trying to comprehend the situation. I snapped out of it and slammed the bars over my window, locking them and running upstairs to the storage room where I pushed a table to the door and called the cops. As I listened and expected the two to come inside at any minute, I heard a loud crash and the bars from the windows being shaken aggressively. 
When they realized that they couldn't get in, one of them let out a long, angry scream that probably woke up half the neighborhood. By the time the cops came, they were long gone. The police couldn't find out who it was, but were more active in the neighborhood in the following weeks. Regardless, I wasn't keen on staying there, so shortly after, I moved out. My sister sold the house a few months later, and as far as I know, nothing similar ever happened since. I honestly don't know what they wanted, or why they were so determined to get in. But whoever it was, let's not meet again. In June of this year, I moved out of my parents' apartment as I finally got a steady job and longed for some sort of freedom. I looked for apartments that were affordable in my city and found one that's a two or three minute walk from my parents' apartment. To me, it was perfect. I'd get to live alone and my parents would still be nearby so I could visit them whenever I wanted or pop in to have breakfast with them. The apartment itself is great. It's not really much to look at, but for a single male, it's more than enough. My apartment has a long corridor connecting each room together from the sides, with my apartment door being at the start of the corridor. My bedroom is the second room on the left, but since the walls are pretty thin, you can literally hear people in the apartment complex walking and talking and whatever else they do from my bedroom. Last week, I came home from the pub after meeting up with a few friends. It wasn't really late, around 10.15 or 10.30ish, and I had the day off, so I took a shower and hopped into bed to watch Netflix. It was probably around midnight when I heard a faint knock coming from the front door. I stopped the show that I was watching and listened for a minute or so, and just thought that it was my mind playing tricks on me. I continued watching Netflix when once again I heard a two-motion knock on my door. I sat up from bed, went to the door, and looked through the peephole. And sure enough, it was pitch black. I once again shrugged it off and went back to my room, but before I could even sit down properly, I heard a slightly louder knock. At this point, I thought it was my friends playing a prank on me, so I called my friend and asked if he was knocking on my door. And if he was, it wasn't amusing. He paused for a second and said, Dude, I'm at home. I have to be up at like 7.30. I believed him and hung up the phone. I was talking pretty loudly, so whoever was knocking probably heard me. And as soon as I hung up, I heard another knock. At this point, I was pretty pissed off. So I walked to the door, looked through the peephole again, and saw nothing. I then unlocked the door and took a peek, and then I closed the door and locked it. Me, being angry and a bit intoxicated, I decided to wait and catch whoever was knocking. So I spent a solid ten minutes silently looking through the peephole, before being a bit startled as someone put their hand over it and knocked again. I immediately started unlocking the door and ran out to the apartment hall. I heard someone booking it down the steps and heard them lean against the wall as his jacket shrugged the wall. So I ran a few steps down before realizing that whoever this is was waiting behind the corner to get the jump on me. I hurried back inside and called the cops. They were there within a few minutes and scanned the building and the street, but couldn't find anyone. They told me that it could just be some kids pulling a prank and to never run after someone. They kept the patrol car around the entire night, and the knocking stopped. It could have been some kids being dumb, but the part that gave me the fucking creeps was the fact that whoever it was ran down the stairs and stopped behind the corner. They didn't keep running. If it were some pranksters, I find it more likely that they would have just booked it outside. As I said, it's been a week and the knocking stopped. It kept me on edge for a few days because I just expected to be jumped by someone when walking into my apartment. But so far, nothing has come of it. I've let it go and just hope that it won't happen again.
A few years ago, I was on a train home. It was a warm summer afternoon, and I remember being in a particularly good mood as I stood by the train doors, looking out of the window. The sun was shining, I felt good, and I didn't want to spend the rest of the evening stuck indoors. So I thought, why not get off the train a stop early and walk the rest of the way home? So that's what I did. I got off the train at Lewisham Station, which is around a 30-minute walk from my then home, which was situated not far from Hither Green Station, my original destination, and started slowly walking home. I could have taken a shortcut and followed a busy road towards Hither Green, but instead decided to walk the longer route through the nearby shopping center and up the busy Lewisham High Street in search of some smiles and excitement. The high street was unusually quiet that day. I'm not sure if there was a big sporting event happening or something, but I remember there weren't as many cars or people around as usual. I had a pleasant, slow walk along the high street, enjoying every last photon I could absorb, and came to a junction where I had to turn left onto Court Hill Road, which leads up to a hill to Hither Green Lane. As soon as I turned left onto Court Hill Road, my attention was immediately drawn to on the opposite side of the road, a lady pushing a pushchair up the hill. She had a baby in the buggy that I couldn't see at the time, and a small toddler walking and skipping alongside her, holding onto the left handle of the buggy. I smiled to myself, thinking how heartwarming they looked together. Remembering back when I was that age, happily skipping along, holding onto my mother's hand. They were probably 75 meters ahead of me when I turned onto the road, and we were walking at pretty much the same pace. For no reason whatsoever, I decided to speed up a bit. A minute or two later, I'd gotten maybe a third of the way along the road and had closed the gap between us a bit, but they were still maybe 50 meters ahead of me. For no reason whatsoever, I suddenly felt like jogging. So I very lazily started jogging, more like bouncing up the hill and all I could think about was this family on the opposite side of the road. I was fixated on them. Then, again, for no reason whatsoever, I suddenly wanted to cross the road, despite the fact that I lived on the left side, and crossing was the opposite of what I'd normally do. It made no sense for me to cross over, but I wanted to. So I step out into the road, which was totally silent, with not a car in sight and start bouncing diagonally across the road. I physically couldn't have jogged any slower. I was in this relaxed, zen-like state. I was in no hurry to get home, but had this urge to get closer to this family walking ahead of me. They were like a magnet, drawing me closer. I was jogging straight towards them. I got to around 30 meters behind them, in the middle of the road now, still not a car in sight, and decided I'd speed up a bit. Not much. I was still bouncing, but with just a little pinch more effort. They were almost at the top of the hill at this point, and I was maybe two-thirds of the way up. Suddenly, for no reason whatsoever, the toddler, a little girl, decides to dance straight into the middle of the road. Her mother, in an obvious panic, screamed at the girl to get out of the road, which instead caused the girl to panic herself, freeze to the spot, and start crying. The mother still holding the buggy, had also frozen in panic and stood screaming. That's when I heard the engine. At the top of Court Hill Road is a right turn that leads to Hither Green Lane. Both sides of the road have trees and brick walls lining them, so it's impossible to see around the corner, no matter which direction you're heading. Vehicles often drive far too quickly when coming down the hill and usually exit the corner at the top end of second gear around 30 miles per hour. I could hear a vehicle coming, a diesel engine by the sounds of it. It was revving hard, and the girl wasn't moving. I didn't speed up. I just kept bouncing straight up the middle of the road towards the girl at the same pace, totally zen, totally relaxed. Almost too relaxed. My mind was clear. She was facing uphill and had no idea I was coming. The mother also had no idea I was there. I got to around 10 meters behind them when the white van came flying around the corner. In five seconds time, the van would be where I was currently standing, 10 meters behind this girl. 
and it wasn't slowing down. The girl was frozen in panic. The mother was frozen in panic. It was time to be a hero. I got to the girl and slipped one hand under each of her armpits. I look up and see the van is two seconds away, if that. I lifted her a foot off the ground, turned right, and took a step towards the pavement. I was still in the road. I knew the van was going to hit me as there was no time, and I thought that if it did, and I was still holding the girl, that she'd end up being dragged backwards along the road with me. So instead of putting her on the ground, I stood, arms out straight, holding her a foot above the pavement, thinking that after the impact had taken me out, gravity would be the stronger of the two forces and would gently pull her down towards the pavement. The van flew past, and luckily I was only clipped on the left shoulder by the wing mirror. It barely touched me. I put the girl down on the pavement, who was now standing silent and totally confused as to how she'd somehow floated the ten feet from the middle of the road to her mother's side, span around to face me, got down on one knee, and said sternly, Hey, look at me. Never go in the road again. Do you hear me? At which point she realized what had happened and started crying again. Or maybe I'm just that ugly and my face scared her. The mother, who was still frozen in fear up until this point, now stood staring at me, jaw open, wondering where the hell I'd come from. She snapped out of it and started thanking me. Oh my god, thank you, oh my god. I just smiled, nodded, and walked on. I turned and looked back, and saw the mother rubbing the girl up and down, checking for injuries and hugging her. I laughed. Over the years, I've replayed this event a thousand times in my head. Two seconds, that's all she had left. From the moment I scooped her up to the moment the van flew past us was two seconds. If I hadn't got off the train a stop early, she was dead. If I hadn't sped up at the bottom of the hill, she was dead. If I hadn't decided to start jogging for no reason, she was dead. If I hadn't decided to cross the road and head straight towards them, she was dead. If I'd done anything differently that day, the world would have lost this beautiful little girl. I often wonder how her life turned out. She's probably a sassy teenager now. I cannot accept that everything that happened leading up to it was a random coincidence. It felt like I was being sucked towards them. Why did I start jogging uphill? Why did I cross over? Why was I so fixated on them? Why did I speed up when I was having such an enjoyable slow walk? Why was I so relaxed that, even when I saw the van meters away from my face, I didn't break out of the slow jog? It's like I just knew I'd get there in time and everything would be okay. The world is weird and I have many questions. Thanks for listening. Merry Christmas. I live in a small city college town where homelessness is a big issue. Down the road from my house at the time, there's a neighborhood Walmart that I always went to. Whenever I would go to this Walmart, I was always looking over my shoulder because of how many homeless people tend to hang out at this particular store and have on occasion followed me in and out of the store. As a woman in general, I'm always on guard, but surrounding the circumstances surrounding this store, I tend to get very paranoid when I'm there. Anyways, in the middle of the day on a weekday, I decided to stop by said Walmart to grab something small. When I pull into this Walmart, I always try to park as close to the front as possible with my driver's side facing the store so people can see me better. This day, I couldn't find a close parking spot. I instead found the closest thing I could find, and as soon as I pulled into the parking spot, I had a sinking feeling in my gut. I looked to my left to see two men in a black SUV and the driver staring at me. I looked away for a second, and when I looked back, I saw the guy in the passenger seat staring at me as if the driver had told him to look over. 
There's no way to perfectly describe this, but the look felt almost like a nod of approval to his friend that made me feel very uneasy. Against my better judgement, I decided to turn my car off and head inside. I figured I was only getting something small, so I'd be in and out, no biggie. I grabbed what I wanted, and when I headed to the self-checkout, there was an issue that would cause me to have to move to a cashier to check me out, and the whole process ended up taking a lot longer than anticipated. While I was waiting on the cashier, I noticed the man that was in the passenger seat was pacing outside the front doors of the Walmart looking in. I immediately felt that my gut was correct from earlier and that he was waiting for me to head back to my car. I turned my back to him to check out and when I looked back, I noticed that he walked inside the store. At this point, I thought I was crazy and that the guy is probably coming inside to get some stuff and that I'm just paranoid from past experiences at this store. Anyways, as I'm leaving, I remembered a TikTok I saw where someone said they'd interviewed a man who attacked women, and the man gave a few different reasons as to why he wouldn't attack particular women, one of them being that some women were on FaceTime. As I'm leaving the store and headed to my car, I decided to FaceTime my best friend, who I knew would answer the phone. As soon as I'm walking up to my car, she answers, and I look up to see the driver on the passenger side of his vehicle, blocking my way with his back passenger door wide open. My heart immediately dropped, and I asked the man to move out of the way. He looked down at my phone, and then closed the door and moved out of the way. I'm assuming he looked at my phone to see if I was actually on FaceTime with someone, I quickly got into my car and started to drive away. As I was leaving, I saw the man who was in the passenger seat coming around the corner quickly with a grin on his face and nothing in his hands from the store. I know I can be a very paranoid person, especially when it comes to this kind of thing. However, the whole encounter felt odd and didn't add up in a way that I felt could be written off that easily. Does anyone have any thoughts? This happened only a few weeks ago. I live close to the Angeles National Forest. There are some trails within walking distance from my home that take you up into those mountains. It was a very foggy evening, and having just received some bad news over the phone, I wanted to clear my mind with a night hike. I set off at around 8pm, sad boy music in my earbuds and a camelback with water and supplies. I didn't plan to be out too long, but I was definitely going to be out a while. The hike started off great, and the fog was almost sort of a novelty, very eerie and calm in a neat sort of way. The only sounds came from water dripping off the plants along the mountainside. Nobody was around, and it felt like I had the mountains to myself. I was hiking without using my flashlight, as it was like driving. High beams of light cut my visibility from about 20 feet to 10 feet. Shining the light would be like facing a wall of whiteness, and it would kill my night vision. After about an hour, things started getting weird. I was maybe two and a half miles up the trail, and the only light came from the glow of the city behind me. It was getting darker the farther I got up and into the mountains. I started smelling. Smells. Synthetic. First, it was perfume for a few seconds. Just a whiff. I couldn't see more than 15 feet or so in front of me at that point, so I was kind of like... Huh. Kind of odd. The second smell was that of a campfire which was also odd, as there weren't any campgrounds nearby. I shrugged it off and kept going. I then got a whiff of a plant that brought me back to my childhood, as it reminded me of smelling it during summers when I would play outside with my friends. I wasn't too off-put, but it was indeed a bit strange. A little while later, I noticed a dull flash out of the corner of my eye. It was light coming from a flashlight but it was above me on the ridge, maybe 50 to 100 foot up. It looked like a glow in the clouds, sort of like how a plane looks flying through a cloud. It would get brighter or dimmer based on direction. 
To my knowledge, though, there weren't any trails up there. It's really weird. I took my earbuds out and listened. Still silence, except for the light. The light would turn on, sweep, turn off, then turn on and shine in a different direction, like someone looking for something. I assumed they were having the same visibility problems I was. I had stopped completely and watched as the light would continue to turn on and off and move slowly along the ridge. I kept my earbuds out now, and I was just telling myself it was another hiker. I waited for it to pass above me and kept on. After maybe ten minutes, I heard whistling, sort of like someone calling a dog, but from a distance. I looked back, and while I was unable to orient myself due to the fog, the whistling was coming from the light that I could now see was across the canyon I'd been walking along. In terms of distance, it was probably about a sixth of a mile, just a faint glow through the fog. I watched it for a minute, then kept moving. After maybe another hour and a half, I stopped for some water. The trail had turned from dirt to this sandy, crunchy soil. It had only gotten darker, and I was around 3,200 feet in elevation, so the city lights were not as bright anymore. I noted that my footsteps were the loudest thing out there, which was a bit unsettling. The trail twists and turns along the mountainsides, and there would be these scenic viewpoints at the turns that would give you maybe 50 feet or so to go off the trail and look over the edge into the valley. I was about 4.5 miles out at this time, so I went out to the edge of the closest view to assess if I wanted to keep going or not. I felt great, and although my cell service had been spotty, I was trying to look at sat maps to see what was ahead of me and maybe pick a turnaround point. I was also getting texts now that hadn't been able to deliver since my service was in and out, so I wanted to check those too. I'm at the edge of the view, and someone had made a little rock sculpture thing with a weird stick. I took a picture of it. I was just chilling out there for maybe two minutes or so and looking at the sculpture. I can't see the trail because of the fog and darkness, but I know where it is based on direction. Here's where it gets absolutely terrifying. I pull out my phone to check my texts one last time before setting off, and as soon as I look down at my phone, I hear five very fast footsteps from the direction of the trail. This was the sound that my feet made because of the soil, and I recognized it immediately. I instantly look in that direction, and they stopped completely. Silence. I scrambled to get my flashlight and knife out of my bag versus using my phone light and fists and shined in that direction. A wall of fog and silence. The footsteps were not a gallop or the skittering of an animal. It was the footsteps of something running at me on two legs that stopped on a dime. I could feel the terror rising in my chest as I stood there frozen. I was alone in the dark, up in the mountains, and something was up here with me. I'm getting goosebumps just typing this. I stood there for maybe two minutes with the light facing that direction. The biggest problem was that they came from the direction of the trail that I needed to go to to get back. I thought, screw this, I'm heading back. I slowly approached the trail and walked through where the sound came from and began to head back down. For maybe the next 20 minutes, every two minutes or so, I would quickly stop and shine the light behind me. I could have sworn maybe two or three times, I heard an extra step in the distance behind me, like something was matching my footfall to remain undetected. I was fast walking now, as the visibility was still too poor to run, and I was worried I'd twist an ankle. I kept my light on the whole time and had my knife out in my other hand. After maybe 30 minutes or so, I heard something crash through the brush on my right, which was the steep side of the canyon. Again, I cannot see anything because of the fog. I moved to the other side of the trail and kept going. Let me tell you, that was the most determined I've been to make it down a trail. I heard other weird sounds along the way, but I ignored them and kept moving. I will never forget that night. I night hiked one more time on that same trail, but it was clear. I had a headlamp on the whole time, 
and a much bigger knife on my side. I also ran back down when I reached my turnaround point. This happened in October three years ago, while I was solo climbing Huron Peak in Colorado, and every word is true. Before I left on this trip, I got an email telling me that I had a bunch of REI reward points that were about to expire. My kit didn't really need anything, so I cashed them out on a really badass Tonto-style survival knife that I never would have bought full price. I'd been living with my parents all summer to help out with my mom's illness, so I was desperate for a bit of solitude. But I knew the trailhead sites would be crowded even late in the season, because Huron is a popular-ish 14er. My car had terrible ground clearance, so no way in hell I was getting it up the 4x4 road to the trailhead anyway. I found a spot to park my car off to the side before the road gets too rough and hiked about three-fourths of a mile down what I initially thought was a deer trail. Surprisingly, the trail ended at a prepared campsite next to a beaver pond, leveled dirt, rock fire pit, a few old beer cans. It's almost too perfect. I look around to make sure I'm not in a rancher's backyard or something, but there are no signs of structures visible, and grass was growing in the fire pit. Probably months since someone overnighted here, I figured. Since it was October, it was already sundown, and by the time I got my hammock strung up and cooked dinner, it was pitch dark. The whole time I'd been using my new knife for everything, cutting lengths of paracord for the hammock tarp, opening my food. Hell, I was making up excuses to use this thing. I wanted to hit the trail early, so I started getting ready for bed right after dinner. I trek off into the woods a bit to hang my bear bag at a safe distance, but when I get back, my knife is gone. I was positive I'd left it at the edge of the fire pit, but I tear the whole side apart looking for it anyway. About halfway through, I start getting that prickly feeling that I'm not alone and I'm being watched. Finally, exhausted and paranoid, I give up. I announce loud enough for anyone at the perimeter of my lights to hear, but quiet enough that it's plausible I'm talking to myself. Well, at least I still have the gun. I'm sure it sounded pretty lame and it was a pure bluff. I had no firearms with me whatsoever. I pretended to lie down in my hammock and, after about 20 minutes or so, I hear what sounds like faint footsteps going away from me, down the trail back to the road. I spent the entire night wide awake, clutching my shitty pocket knife. At first light, I break camp and shove everything in the car. Then I drive the poor thing as far up the 4x4 road as I can. I did not want to have to come back here. It was a beautiful day. I summited ahead of schedule, shared lunch with some friendly fellow hikers, and almost forgot about the whole ordeal. As I walked back to the car, now parked about four to five miles from where I camped, I noticed there was something stuck under the driver's side wiper, like a parking ticket. It was my knife. I often like to go out running in the summer, or whenever the weather is nice. This happened a week before I was supposed to start high school. I thought about going running that day, but I got that idea in the morning, and I run in the evening while the sun is still up, but it isn't as hot as it is in the day, and there isn't a chance for it to get hotter if I don't manage to get back in time like in the morning. Well, of course I forgot my promise to myself, and only remember it around 9pm. Now it's the end of summer, so the sun is already setting sooner than I'm used to. But I go, eh, I'll get back in like an hour or so. It'll be fine. I already have been putting off running, so I don't want to put it off again. I should probably mention that I'm a female, and even though a lot of girls I know change the side of the road they walk on when they see even distinctly drunk-looking guys walking, 
I was the one calling them scared and was ready to take on the first rogue who tried to get me. I also live in a less populated area out of town where almost everyone knows everyone, so I was feeling extra sure of my safety. What a naive fool, I know. So I go out. I start my run and it's fine. It's getting a bit dark, but I can still see the running track, so it's all good. I start to feel a bit off when I see a pair walking in front of me. When I get closer, they turn out to be just teen guys, and I run past them with no problem. When I finally reach the usual point in my run where I turn around, at a cemetery, it has gotten pretty dark out. I drink some water from my bottle and just stand there under a tree next to the gate in the territory of the cemetery. But I don't sit down where I usually do because the bench is next to a fence and the darkness has finally made me a little weary about being alone and having someone jumping me. It's pretty funny that that's what scared me the most at the time. When I catch my breath, I stay for a few more minutes just listening to the wind. I see a bike drive past the cemetery, taking the route I will take while running back. I leave my resting place and it's gotten really dark, dark enough that I could barely see two meters in front of me. I start slowly running back. After about 15 meters or so, I start hearing voices. A couple more meters, and I can clearly hear someone talking. My thoughts immediately jump to a conclusion that there are at least two people in front of me if I'm hearing a conversation. Now I slow down even more until I get close enough to actually hear what's being said. Keep in mind it's completely dark, and this road doesn't have street lights, so I can't see anything. I get close enough to finally make out the words and my heart sinks at what I hear. I can't recall the exact words that were said, but I did hear. I see this girl. I could just pull her into the bushes. There were tall bushes lining one side of the running track. As I said, at first, my heart stops, but immediately after I go into fight or flight mode, I can hear my heart beating in my ears, and I'm full of adrenaline. The bad kind. I know I can't just stop, or he will know I heard what he said, so I continue to walk, but thank god that the running track is separated from the road by a small grass field, so I go to the side of the road, making some distance between us. I keep looking at him. Keep in mind, I still don't even know how many people are there, but I see a square of light, presumably a phone, and then I hear him jump on his bicycle and drive off. It turned out he was talking on the phone, but just because he wasn't alone didn't mean I was less scared of him. I walk on the side of the road for a good few minutes until I'm sure he would be far away from me. And once I get back on the running track, I sprint home like crazy. All the way back, I was shaking with fear and looking at the bushes and the cars that passed me with delirium, squishing my water bottle in my hand ready to smack anyone who came close to me. When I finally reached the first road lights, I felt like I escaped death. I hope you enjoyed that guys. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Brock Ballard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, 
Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madis Afelter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdoski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lily Pan, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyera, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cubex, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.